We're going to talk about caches today and maybe next time too. Although I'll try to breeze through it so that we finish today. Since you're telling me that you, are, you already know all of this. Right. <laughs> Say it again. It, oh, it's only him. OK, that, it's, it's only her. That's good. <laughs> but you've probably seen caches in 2.13, right? And in maybe other classes too. But they're really important. That's why people have been working on them for decades and decades and decades. And I predict that they're going to be working on them for decades and decades and decades more. <laughs> One of the major conferences in computer architecture is ISCA, International Symposium on Computer Architecture. There was a joke at some point that this was the International Symposium on Cache Architecture, ISCA, right? And there's still cache papers in ISCA. People are inventing new things to manage caches. It's amazing how much creativity people have. It's amazing what people have not thought of over time. So if you have a different look at the problem, maybe you can come up with much better solutions. And the problems are different today also, so we'll cover some of those. But before that, this is a fun part of the course. You have a lot of nice labs. And you'll actually implement the data cache and get it to work. But please do it early. <laughs> please finish the labs early so that you don't run into the time management problem. <laughs> so that's a big advice. Time management is really important. It's even more important today than in past decades, I guess, because you're overwhelmed with so many data points in life today which didn't exist five decades ago. <laughs> so you could consider yourself lucky that you're really very good data processing engines, except you need to filter out the data well and manage your time well. <laughs> so you can use some of the principles of caching, maybe. <laughs> OK, uh, this is, I've already shown you this agenda. We're going to cover caches. And these are some of the readings, uh, cache chapters. I say these are required, but if you understand everything in the lecture, you don't really need to do the readings. Uh, we'll ask you to review these two papers. One is a fundamental cache paper. It's only two pages. And it'll, gonna be easy to under, it'll be easy to understand. And the other we'll talk about. These are, this is a review. We've talked about this, basically. Caches are essentially structures that exploit locality of reference in memory, temporal and spatial locality. There are two types of locality, as we've discussed. And caches actually can be constructed in many ways. They can be software, hardware. We're going to focus a lot on hardware caches this time. And they can exploit temporal locality or spatial locality or both. Modern caches exploit both. But you can imagine a cache that exploits spatial locality only and not temporal locality for a given word that you've accessed, right? Basically, whenever you access a word, don't cache that, but cache things around it. It kind of exploits only spatial locality, right? If not, you're not going to use that word again. That makes sense. And if uh, to exploit only temporal locality, not spatial locality, you just cache that word and nothing else around it. Right? That's the cache you're going to build, actually, in your data cache uh, lab. Unless you do a load byte. In that case, you're really going to cache the bytes around it, too. <laughs> OK? OK, keep in mind that this, is, I mean, this, this can be constructed in many, many ways. And this was the slide that we've covered. Block is the unit of storage in the cache. Uh, and I'm going to go into more detail here. And hit or miss, remember, cache hit means the block is in the cache, the block that you're trying to access. And miss means it's not in the cache, so you need to somehow bring it into the cache. And while doing so, you may need to kick out something else. So we're going to look at different ways of what to kick out and maybe what to do with the blocks in the cache. There are many important cache design decisions, many of which we'll get to, but some of which we will not get to perhaps, or we may get to depending on how much time we have. Uh, one of the design decisions in today's caches that didn't really exist much uh, long ago is when you have multiple cores sharing a cache, how do you actually divide the cache between the cores? Or do you actually divide the cache between the cores at all? Who do you give more space to, if at all? That's, that's something that affects quality of service that each core gets, for example, right? And uh, that interference in the cache caused a lot of performance issues. So for example, if one core has a large working set, which we will talk about, it, uh, it, it, it operates with lots of data, it may occupy the entire cache, whereas another core may get very little cache, or no cache at all, right? Or no cache space at all. OK, so this was the slide that I stopped at. Basically, this is kind of the abstract view of a cache. You supply an address to it. 
And there's some metadata, we could call this a metadata or tag store, that basically does bookkeeping and answer the, answers the question, is this address in the cache? Right. And it does other bookkeeping to decide what to keep in the cache and what not to keep in the cache. And we will see some of that metadata. But this is the abstract view. And the answer you get out of this is when you access the cache is, is this address a hit or a miss in the cache? That's the, question, uh, that's the answer to this question, is this address in the cache? And there's also a data store, which is really what the cache is. It's really the data, not the, the metadata. It stores the memory blocks that are currently in the cache. Right? And it supplies the data. And even by looking at this abstraction, you can, you can see many design choices. Right? Do you access the data sto tag store first and then data store ne next? Or do you access them in parallel? And that's a very valid question, and we will see. If you access them in parallel, maybe by the time you get this hit-miss signal, you also get the data, and then you can get the data right away. Right? But if you access them in parallel, and if you get a miss, you wasted an access to the data store. Right? You basically used up a lot of energy powering up the entire data store, the decoders, and all the word line and the bit lines that we've discussed uh, in DRAM or SRAM, depending on what technology this is and wasted a lot of energy. So I'm going to assume for now that we're going to do a ser uh, parallel access, because all, uh, again, at the L1 cache level, think L1 cache level, you really want the data quickly, as quickly as possible, right? if it's a hit. OK. So let's look at the uh, cache hit rate a little bit. I'll, I'll define some things, uh, and we'll get back to this. Cache hit rate is basically number of hits that you get divided by number of hits plus number of misses, or number of accesses. right? pretty simple. And based on this, you can calculate an average memory access time, which may, you may have done before in 213, which is basically hit rate times hit latency plus miss rate times miss latency. That's average memory access time for lots of accesses in the program, all accesses in the program. And miss latency, this is a recursive equation if you remember, miss latency is really the average memory access time of the next level. If you have the next level, okay. This is pretty simple, right? Okay. One aside you should probably think of, starting now, is can ideally maybe you would like to reduce average memory access time, right? But when you reduce average memory access time, can you reduce performance? It could happen actually, and we're going to get to that. Because what this doesn't take into account is really the uh, how much stalling cache misses cause, right? This is really not performance. Average memory access time is really not performance. It's really from the point of view of the requests. It's not pro from the point of view of the processor. A request may take a long time, but its latency may be overlapped with some other request, right? And if the latency is overlapped with many other requests, they all may take a long time, but they could stall the processor only for that amount of time that's long. Right. Whereas you may have other requests that take little time, but they all stole the processor. Right. Does that make sense? Because their latency is not overlapped with anything else. So average memory access time is really from the point of view of the requests and not the processor. It's not really the stall time, if you will. That's why reducing average memory access time actually can reduce performance. There are cases, and we'll get to that. Okay. But let's take a look at what this structure, how, would you, how, would, how do we design this structure? So a basic hardware cache design, uh, and we'll start with that. And then we'll examine a multitude of ideas to make it better, hopefully. And as, as we make it better, we'll make it more complex also. That's unfortunate, right? There's, there's no better in a sense. There, there are always trade-offs. You improve something at the expense of something else. Basically. Uh, we, I've said that the basic unit of storage in a cache is a block. And conceptually, we divide memory into fixed size blocks, logically. Right? Each block maps to a location in the cache determined by the index bits in the address. So you can think of uh, the, uh, an 8-bit address, let's say. And you can have some index bits that determine where the block is. And this, is, this address is, these index bits are used to index into the tag and data stores. So if you go back to this figure over here, you don't use the full address, but you use some index bits because you, you have limited amount of space in the tag store. Right? Okay. So on a cache access, 
uh, this is how a cache access works. Basically, you first index into the tag and data stores with the index bits in the address, and then check the valid bits in the tag store. Is this tag, uh, tag store entry valid? And compare the tag bits in the address with the store tag in the tag store. Does that make sense? It's pretty simple again, right? So if a block is in the cache, the store tag should be valid and match the tag of the block. Okay? So you've done this in 2.13 in your cache lab, hopefully. So this is basically what I described to you is really a direct map cache. Right? Because you, at a given index, you have a single tag. And that tag could be valid or not valid. If it's not valid, that means that in that particular location in the cache, there's nothing cached. If it's valid, there's a tag. And if the tag matches, then you've hit there. Basically, let's think about an example. Assume a byte addressable memory. We'll build a simple cache that has 256 bytes. And it has eight byte blocks. In that memory, you have 32 blocks, right, conceptually. And you can look at this memory this way. Basically, these are, uh, this is one block, eight bytes, next block, next block, next block. So you have 32 blocks over here. And the green ones over here, uh, well, we'll get to that, I guess. Assume a cache that has 64 bytes and that, can, uh, that, that, that uses eight blocks. Uh, if it's 64 bytes with an 8-byte eight, eight blocks, you can actually have only 8 blocks, right? Basically, your memory has 32 blocks, but your cache can cache only 8 blocks. And assume it's direct mapped. A block can go to only one location. So this is what the cache looks like. Basically, it has 8 blocks, 8 tag store entries, valid and tag. Let's do that. And correspondingly, data store entries. And this is what our address looks like, right? Basically, we have an 8-bit uh, address, right? because a byte addressable memory, 256 bytes, that's 8-bit address. And 8-byte blocks. 8-byte blocks means uh, 3 bits at the bottom of the address. Whenever you do a load, they specify which byte in the block that you're accessing, right? or which byte your access starts from if you're accessing multiple bytes. And the next 3 bits can be your index. Because we have eight blocks in the cache, and this is direct map. Basically, we can identify those eight blocks by using these three bits. Okay. And if you look at this now, uh, these four locations in memory, these four blocks in memory, map to the same location in the cache. Right? Because I guess I will do this. If you look at the addresses of these, uh, oh, we don't have it. Thanks. <laughs> I guess that was supposed to be, I cannot see it. <laughs> oh, it's, it still needs to be rotated. Oh, I missed it, I guess. There you go. Well, ignore this part. It's going to come. <laughs> but basically, uh, this is 8 bytes. Uh, this is the next 8 bytes in, uh, in memory. This is the next 8 bytes. Dot, dot, dot. Uh, so the address of these eight bytes, you're, we're going to ignore this because this, the term, this tells you the byte in block, but we're looking at granularity of eight bytes. So the address of this is really 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? And the address of the next block is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Next block is 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, dot, 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 until you get to this one, which is 0, 1. 0, 0, 0. And then there's some byte in block for each of the bytes in the 8 bytes over here. So if you look at this, this is the index of the different blocks in memory. And the ones that I circle, uh, that I colored green over here have the same index. These are the memory blocks that map to the same location or same set, as we will see soon, in the cache. And four of them can go to this location, because they share the same index bits due to their address, right? 0, 0, 0. This is index 0, 0, 0. And 0, 0, 1 is here. But they differ by the tag bits. That's why you need the tag. When you access the cache, you need to index it, and then you need to do a tag match. Does that make sense? Doesn't let me know. So how do you access the cache, this particular cache? Basically, we first take the three bits in the index and index into the tag store. If they're 0, 0, 0, you access this location. 
And we also index into the data store, assuming parallel access. Right? What you get after you do this indexing is the tag. In this case, it contains a valid bit and the tag itself, or tag store entry, let's call it. You get a valid bit and a tag that's stored in the tag store. And you also get the data in the data store. Make sense? That's pretty simple. These are memory structures. So this is nice in a sense because now you're doing just one access. It's a random access memory, right? You access the memory. You just directly get the location. And then what we're going to do is to compare the tag with the tag we get. If there's a tag match and if this bit is valid, then the block that we're, the address actually hits in the cache. Right. If not, if, if either this is invalid, or, uh, or if there is no tag match, if the tag doesn't match, you get a miss. And at the same time, assuming we want to get the byte in the block, assuming we're doing a load byte, this happens at the first level cache, you need to mux the byte and block, right? Because the data store contains eight bytes, right? What if you want to access only one byte? And then you get the data out. So this, uh, this, this logic can depend on what you actually do. Here, you will really get the data uh, block. This is the data block that we get. But you want to access the byte in block. Then you basically need to box out the bytes that you're accessing. Right? This could be word also. right? So there, there needs to be some logic here that basically gives you the, either the word or the byte or maybe the double word or the entire cache line. right? If you're actually operating at the entire cache line level, the entire cache line. OK? Does this make sense? It's pretty simple. Is this the same thing you've seen at 213? Yes. OK. So one problem with this particular cache is addresses, as I showed you, addresses with the same index contend for the same location right, in the cache. In fact, these four contend for this location. The next four contend for the next location, dot, dot, dot. And they cause conflict misses. So if you're if your access pattern is such that, let's call this address A, address B, address C, address D, they all map to index 0, 0, 0. And if your access pattern is such that you access A, and then B, and then C, and then D, and then you do, well, let's do A, B, A, B. That's enough. <laughs> right. If your access pattern looks like this, you access A, and then B, and then A, and then B, and then A, and then B, you get a 0% hit rate because they contend for the same location. So how do we solve this problem? Well, I guess, what is the problem? This is what I mentioned. Two blocks in memory that map to the same index in the cache cannot be present in the cache at the same time because you don't have an extra location in that same index. And this can lead to 0% hit rate, as I showed you. These are called conflict misses. So the solution is really set associativity. Basically, instead of having Instead of having one block to store at the same index, have two of them. Right. That's the basic idea. Or if you think about this, uh, let's go back to this thing over here, this thing. Instead of having one column of eight addresses, why not have two columns of four addresses each? This way, at a given index, you can actually store two blocks. OK? That's the idea. So let's construct this cache. Well, you, you see it over there, but we're going to construct it on this screen. So your tag store, it looks like this now. In a given index, you can store two blocks. So you need to really have two tag store entries for a given index. And this is really called a set. And data store is similar. Basically, you can store two blocks at a given index. And when you access the cache, you basically index into the tag store using the index bits, of which you have kind of fewer now, assuming you keep the same size as the before. Uh, and then you get two tag store entries. And then you do two tag matches. And basically, from this, you construct the hit or miss signal. And you can imagine that this is easy. So now you have two comparators. So if one of them matches, does it, uh, has a tag match, then you get a cache hit. Hopefully not both of them will match, right? 
then you have a bug in your cache. <laughs> and based on this, you select which data block that you're going to get. Right? Does that make sense? So you've seen this before also. Now you can implement the data cache lab really easily. It's going to be direct map cache. <laughs> but the extra credit is four-way associativity. Okay. And then you get the data cache block. And then you can choose the Biden block, right? OK? So what we've done here is what, within a given index or within the set, a set is basically the set of blocks that share the same index in the cache. And you can, in this case, it's, you, have, you have two blocks in the set. You have associative memory. right? We've seen associative memory. It's really content addressable memory. Within, a, within an index, now you need to search, if you will. We're, what we're really doing is kind of searching. We're comparing the tag within an index. And in this case, we're comparing the tag to two different tag store entries. This so is the same thing that we had, for example, when we searched for a register, but when you had a tag broadcast in uh, out of order execution in Thomas Lowe's algorithm, you're really searching for that register ID or reservation station ID stored in everywhere in the reservation stations, right? It's the same thing, content addressable memory. Okay? So the upside is now it accommodates conflicts better. If you're accessing A and B, which still share the same index, actually, even though your index bits have become two bits over here, these still share the same index. If you're keeping on accessing A and B, now, a can go here, and B can go here, and they both can coexist in the cache. And you get 100% cache hit rate once your cache is warmed up. Warmed up meaning once both blocks are actually inserted into the cache. Right? Make sense? OK. Of course, there's a downside with every idea. It's more complex, right? As you can see, instead of having a, one, a single comparator for, uh, for the tag store, well, this is getting ahead of myself. You have two comparators. And it's slower access because your logic critical path increases, right? If you, if you see this, your critical path is really going through this part. And you have a larger tag store, too. Because now you need to store, well, you can think of it. <laughs> Even though your index, um, your, your tag size is larger now, right? Remember the previous tag size? Well, it's actually over here. Where is the tag? Yeah, it's two bits only. Now what we've done is really we've reduced the number of indices, keeping the same, assuming you keep the same cache size. In order to have more blocks within a set, you need to really reduce the number of index bits. Right? Which means that those bits still need to be compared to, and they need to exist in the tag. They're, they're part of the tag. That's why you have the larger tag store. And there may need to be other things in the tag store. Like one question will be, we will see, if you have these two things in the cache, and if you want to bring in a third thing, which one do you replace? Right. That question didn't really exist in the direct map cache, right? In the direct map cache, you have this thing over here, let's say block A, and you're bringing in block B, you replace block A, right? Whereas here, because there's no choice. It's only one thing that's in the cache. Here, you have block A and block B stored, and you're bringing block C. Which, don't, which one do you replace, A or B? Well, you may want to have some more metadata in the tag store saying, oh, one of them is the most recently used. So you just need one bit here saying either the left one or the right one is most recently used. Right? OK? So this, uh, this is a called a set, but this is also called a way, if you will. This is a way 0 and way 1. Same as way zero and way one. Okay, you know all of this terminology too. Okay, way can be a little bit confusing actually because this is the physical way, if you will. This is if you look at the physical structure, this is a way in the cache, and this is another way. But you can think of it as a per set entity as well. This is one way within the set. This is another way within the set, and you'll hear people talking about most recently used way. Well, that's now per set, right? Because most recently used block can be here, 
in this state. In this set, it could be here. In this set, it could be here. Right. OK? You'll hear uh, people think, talking about LRU way, for example, least recently used way. That depends on which set you're in. OK. So we've solved the problem, A and B problem, but what if you're accessing ABC repeatedly? You still have that problem, right? If you, if you have three blocks that have the same index and you keep accessing them in a circular manner, ABC, 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 you still run into conflict misses here. So we would like to fix that problem. You increase the associativity, make it four-way. Now your tag store looks like this. Instead of, uh, instead of two columns of four blocks each, we have four columns of two blocks each. And we have two indices, 0 and 1. And we have a similar data store. And this is our logic for, to determine hits. And now we have four comparators. Okay. The upside is likelihood of conflict misses is hopefully even lower. Because now you can accommodate a pattern that looks like ABCD. A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. The downside is even more complexity, right? More tag comparators and a wider data max. If you look at this, this complexity also increases because you need to select which block hits. And more power also, right? And larger tags. I don't show the address here, unfortunately, but if you look at the address, now your index bit is only one bit because it's, it could be either 0 or 1. Uh, your byte and block doesn't change because we have 8 byte blocks. That's 3 bits. And your tag bits are now 4 bits. And your power increases because every time you access, you really need to do four comparisons. And this wide mux. OK. So you can take this further and make this fully associative. And fully associative cache is special because a block in memory can be placed in any location in the cache. Right? So you don't have this rigid index. So in other words, index bits are eliminated. Right? It's, a, it's really a content addressable memory at this point. You're really using comparing. Uh, almost all of your address, except for the byte and block, actually, the ta uh, almost all of your address is your tag. And you co you're comparing that to all of the tag store entries uh, in the cache. And for our cache that can store eight, eight blocks, this is what the tag store now looks like. Right? There is no index. You just take the tag from the address and compare it to every possible tag uh, in the in the cache, and then you get a hit or miss signal, and then you pick the right data block using that hit or miss signal, depending on which comparator over here matches. Right. Does that make sense? Or any questions? Basically, the key is you have very flexible mapping. Any block can be any memory block can be placed in any location. If you look at this thing that I showed you earlier, there is no inflexibility in mapping anymore. Every block can go to any location, no, any location over here in the cache, because you're really doing a full comparison of the entire address, entire cache address, I should say. And I'll define the cache address. Is the cache address of a block is really this part, right? Because this, this part doesn't really matter. Uh, for, for doing a cache access, at least uh, not, not for uh, other than selecting the Biden block. This is really the cache address of the block. And you're doing a full comparison of the cache address of the block with the addresses that are stored in the tag store. OK, so hopefully this is simple since you've already no, no caches. Now, the big downside of this is it's really the logic, uh, the critical path, power, and everything we've talked about. So. Uh, what is associativity? It's really uh, how many blocks can map to the same index or same set, right? If the answer is 1, it's direct mapped. It's the, if the answer is the number of cache blocks in the cache, it's really fully associative. Right? Higher associativity has benefits. It has higher hit rate, hopefully. It's not always the case, actually, because <laughs> you could actually saturate your hit rate. This is the curve, usually, that you get. As you increase the size of uh, associativity of your cache, you get a good boost going from 1 to 2, direct map to 2-way, and smaller boost going from 2 to 4, and then diminishing returns over time. And not over time, but with associativity, with higher associativity. The downside is you get slower cache access because your hit latency 
as well as data access latency degrades because of this, all of this logic over here that you need to build. And you can imagine what that is. And all the muxing over here. And you get more expensive hardware, more comparators, and more energy as well. And this is the diminishing returns from higher associativity that I mentioned. As you increase the associativity, this is what happens to hit rate. And sometimes you can imagine that it doesn't actually change at all, right? Your hit rate. Because maybe your access patterns are not this way. Right? OK. So we're going to talk about uh, issues and uh, a lot of issues in set associative caches. So think of each uh, block in a set having a priority. Right? You have multiple blocks in a set. And you want to assign some kind of priority to them, indicating how important it is to keep the block in the cache. In a direct map cache, this doesn't matter, right? Because you have only one block in a set. But uh, if you have multiple blocks in a set, you need to uh, make a decision of what, uh, which block to evict, for example. Right? So a key issue that we're going to consider is how do you determine or adjust block priorities? And there are really three key decisions you make uh, in a set at three different times. We're going to focus on one of them a lot, but I'd like you to uh, get this big picture, because all of these decisions are important. I'll call, I call them insertion, promotion, and eviction. Eviction is the same as replacement. Insertion is, the, how, do you, how do you answer the question, what happens to priorities of cache blocks on a cache hit? Uh, cache fill, sorry. Cache fill means you missed in the cache, and you're bringing a block into the cache. What do you do? Well, there are actually multiple questions here, right? First of all, where do you insert the incoming block? Do you make it really high priority, right? such that it gets evicted late, uh, much later? Or do you make it low priority, such that it, it gets evicted earlier? Or do you even not, in, what about not inserting the block, right? That's actually a decision that you make at the time of insertion. I'd like to stretch your mind. We're going to talk about different policies. But you may decide not to insert the block. Right? And actually, modern, modern processors employ policies where they, kind of, they don't insert the block at the highest priority. Right? Highest priority means this is the most important block. I just fetched it. This is the most important block. It's the most recently used or referenced block, if you will. And I'm going to assume that I'm going to access it over and over. OK. Promotion is what happens to priorities on a cache hit. When you access the cache and you hit in the cache, what do you do to the priorities? Do you adjust them in some way? So you've probably seen the LRU policy. LRU policy says when you hit a cache block in the cache, make it the most recently used, which means that make it the highest priority, right? such that it's going to be evicted the latest after this point. Okay? But that's not necessarily the only policy that you can implement. In fact, that may be a bad thing to do, depending on your access pattern. Okay. Eviction or replacement is what happens to priorities on a cache miss. Right? Whenever you miss in the cache, which one, which block do you evict? And how do you adjust the priorities after that? Okay. So if you look at LRU policy, when you insert a uh, let's assume that you have, I don't know, we can pick the four-way cache. If you look at the LRU policy, for each of these, oh, I don't have it again. It's a good one. Let's assume that you have blocks A, B, C, D in the cache. And uh, this is the most recently used. This is the MRU minus one. <laughs> This is the most recently used minus 2, and this is the least recently used. Uh, when you, wh what you do is, when you get a cache miss to E, let's say, LRU policy says this is the lowest priority, so I'm going to evict this one. That's what happens on a cache miss. Evict the lowest priority thing. LRU policy says, well, now when you fetch the block E, when you're inserting into the cache, you insert it here. And you insert it with highest, highest priority. Its priority becomes MRU, most recently used. And you adjust the priorities of the other ones. Now MRU becomes MRU minus 1. MRU minus 1 becomes MRU minus 2. 
MRU minus 2 becomes LRU. That's the next to be evicted. Right? That's one concrete example of how LRU pr uh, policy adjusts the priorities. But that's one example, right? If, if you don't like LRU, well, well uh, let's do the other one also. On a hit, on a hit, let's say you hit uh, cache block C. You have another access to C. You obviously hit in the cache. LRU policy, what it does is it says, oh, this was LRU. I hit it, which means that I'm going to predict that I'm going to access it soon again. So I'm going to make it the highest priority, MRU, such that it's going to be the latest one to be evicted from this point. And then you need to adjust the priorities of the other ones, right? This was MRU. It becomes MRU minus 1. MRU minus 1 becomes MRU minus 2. And MRU minus 2 becomes LRU. So it's kind of a stack, really. You're really changing the positions of these blocks in the stack, except insertion kind of screws up the stack. It's not exactly a stack, but it's really, it could be implemented using a stack. OK? So that's kind of how, how LRU works with respect to these different kind of priorities on insertion, promotion, and eviction. You can describe any kind of cache management policy uh, by uh, answering these questions, basically. Random replacement. Insertion, well, pick the location randomly. Uh, on a, on a uh, yeah, promotion, on a cash hit, well, it may not matter, right? Don't do anything. And then eviction, pick the one to be evicted randomly. So you don't have lots of states in this case, right? It's actually pretty cheap, hopefully, except you need to somehow pick things randomly. But you don't really need to store anything. Whereas with LRU, you need to store some bits indicating the relative order of reference of the blocks. Okay. That's the key question. So let's take a look at the eviction or replacement policy. I'll call this eviction and replacement, but really there are three kinds of decisions that are going on. Which block in the set to replace on a cache miss? That's the key uh, question a replacement uh, policy answers. So any invalid block first is a good idea probably, right? If there is an invalid block among these ways, that means that there's nothing in that block. So just put the incoming block there. Make sense? Because you don't want to waste space in the cache. If all blocks are valid, then you consult the replacement policy. Right? And there may be many replacement policies. LRU we talked about. But random is actually a pretty good one, too. Or could be a pretty good one. Could be FIFO, first in, first out. You can imagine whether that's good or bad. Least recently used, we've discussed this, and we're going to look into that more. Uh, not most recently used. This could be a simpler version of least recently used, right? Least recently used, as I just showed you, requires tracking the order of reference within a set. And you do it for each set separately. Whereas not most recently used, much simpler, right? You basically keep track of the maybe most recently used and everything else. And you evict one that's not most recently used. You pick, uh, so if out of these three, yeah, out of these four blocks, let's look at the sec this set. Let's say this is the most recently used. All yeah, well, these are not most recently used, not most recently used, not most recently used. Right. You just need that information. And how do you keep track of that information? Or how many bits do you need to keep track of that information for this set? What is the minimum number of bits you need? One bit? So, one, uh, so you're saying one bit per block. Yeah, but that's not the minimum. That means to four total. You're saying two. What do you do? That's right. It's really the uh, index is overloaded. I know what you mean. <laughs> what index is really overloaded. It's really the way, which way, right? Which physical way is the most recently used? Basically, you have two bits. You can see this, right? In the tag store. And remember, I call, I call this way 0, way 1, way 2, way 3. And this, these bits indicate the most recently used one. 1, 1 is the most recently used one, way 3. Right. And for this other one, assuming that the most recently used one is this one, this block over here, it's really 0, 1. OK? So you just need two bits. These are good exam questions, by the way. <laughs> OK. So it's much simpler. 
as you can see. You just don't evict those and pick randomly among the other ones uh, to evict. Least frequently used, that could be a good policy also, right? All of these uh, depend on, uh, so the cache management policy, how good a cache management policy is, really depends on the access patterns that, that go into the cache. You can uh, think about what kind of access patterns are good for least recently used. If what you're doing is accessing A, B, C, D over and over, A, B, C, D, 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 maybe that least recently used is a good policy, right? OK. What about other policies? Least costly to refetch. So these try to perhaps keep in the cache, but they don't take into account the latency to fetch. Right? Maybe some blocks are much more costly to refetch, even though you're not accessing them a lot. When you access them, when you access a block, it takes a million cycles to fetch. So if you keep it in the cache, you save a million cycles, whereas some other block, when you access it, you can fetch it after five cycles. Well, maybe not five cycles, 50 cycles. Could happen, right? So maybe that's a good consideration also, right? Why, why could this happen? I'll give you one example. I've kind of exaggerated it, but <laughs> yeah. Yes? That's right. That's one reason, why, right? If one block al always is in the next level of the cache, maybe you just don't need to go to memory. Whereas another block is, whenever you access it, it's never in the next level of cache, right? Another reason could be uh, we've seen memory, right? You keep in hitting in the row buffer, for example, for a block. And for another block, you, don't, you always keep missing in the row buffer. Another example could be if you have a multiprocessor and some of the memory is uh, attached to this processor and some of the memory is attached to this processor. And when you're accessing a cache block that's in this memory versus in this memory, it takes a long time to access the far away memory. Right? A lot of systems today are like, like that, actually. They're shared memory multiprocessors. Memory is partitioned across processors. And when you're accessing the cache block that's in your local memory, that's much faster access than a cache, blo uh, a cache block that resides in remote memory. OK? So there are many reasons, actually. It could be contention in the network for some reason for this block. And we'll see another example. But these are uh, things to consider. And people have developed actually policies to do this. And some caches actually implement this, especially in the local versus remote memory part. What about hybrid replacement? We've seen hybrid branch prediction, right? Tournament branch prediction may make sense here, especially if you have multiple access patterns, right? Tournament or hybrid branch predictors work because some branches are predictable with some algorithm because they exhibit some kind of correlation, global correlation across branches. And other branches are predictable if you just look at the behavior of that branch, right? Local correlation. Well, in this case, maybe sometimes your access pattern looks like this, and sometimes your access pattern looks like that. And we'll take a look at this. What about optimal replacement policy? So people actually tried to do, uh, come up with an optimal replacement policy for a while. We'll look at that. <laughs> Maybe you can think of what, what that is. It becomes elusive if you actually define optimal in terms of performance. Optimal in terms of hit rate is easier to define. OK, let's look at uh, LRU a little bit. I'll go through these relatively quickly because the ideas are relatively simple, actually. The key idea in LRU is evict the least recently accessed block, right? And we, the problem is we need to keep track of the access ordering of blocks. Uh, and the, the, the assumption, or the implicit assumption, the prediction LRU makes, these are all predictions, right, about the access pattern, really. Your policies, cache management policies, really make some implicit predictions. And LRU's prediction is that least recently accessed block is going to be accessed again, and again, and again. It's really temporal locality in the end. Uh, the problem is you need to keep track of access ordering of blocks. And if you have a direct map cache, that's not a problem. <laughs> but if you have a fully associated cache, that's a lot of, it's really an order, full total order that you need to keep track of across all of those blocks in the cache, right? So let's, let's start with the easy case. Two-way set associative cache. 
what do you need to implement? What is the minimum amount of bits in a tag store entry that you need to implement LRU perfectly in this case? It's one, right? It's one bit specifying whether it's way zero or way one. For a four-way set associative cache, what do you need to implement to allow you perfect? What is the minimum number of bits that you need? Two bits for what? Per, per, uh, per way. Per way. That's, that's basically eight bits. Yeah. That's good. That maybe is a simple way, but it's not the minimum number of bits. <laughs> because, yes, the two bits, because you need to say, uh, basically, two bits will tell you the relative order, right? Let's say 0, 0 is most recently used, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. This, is, this basically maps to MRU, MRU minus 1, MRU minus 2, and I guess LRU here. You could assign anything, really. <laughs> but this is actually a lot of hardware. Yes. What is the minimum? Yeah. Five. Five bits. How did you come up with it? That's right, yes. He's basically encoding those bits for you. That's right. Five is the right number, actually. And the, that answer, uh, the, first, the way you go about it is how many different orderings are possible. Because what we're really doing with these two bits each is really encoding the different possible orderings, right? In this case, it's pretty flexible. But there may be, if you have a four-way associative cache, there may be really four factorial different orderings that are possible. And that determines how many bits you need to encode the LRU order of a block. Well, why is it four factorial? You can think of it this way, right? You have four potential positions, MRU, you can see this, right? And then to LRU, and this is minus one, minus two. Any of the four blocks can go here. And once you know the MRU, any of the three blocks can be MRU minus one. And once you know that, any of the two blocks, and then you have one block. And that's really four factorial if you've taken some probability. Okay, there's four factorial orderings and log two of four factorial is five bits, right? Well, let's, let's take this further. If you want, and this, this minimizes the number of bits you need to store in a tag store entry, right? You need five bits every tag store entry, five bits here and then five bits here in the tag store entry. What if uh, you have n-way associative? In that case, it's really log base 2 and factorial, right? So it's, it really becomes, well, I'll, I'll, I'll write it down, I think. This is really the number of, minimum number of bits that you need, right? Yes? Yeah, you could do one more thing, right? Yeah. For four-way set associative, you could just, uh, and you know that there's uh, four of them, right? You could just have a separate counter that keeps track of them for each one of the things. But that becomes more expensive. In, the, in terms of the number of bits. Right. So then you're using, okay. Exactly. That's, that, that, those are your two bits, actually. That's kind of doing that. Yeah, yeah. Oh, separate counter meaning access time. I meant like just like a separate mm. position, but then that yeah. would be like a whole separate position. That's right, exactly. Exactly. OK? So this is one of the reasons, actually, true LRU is very hard to implement. And if you, even if you do the encoding really well in the four way associative cache, the logic needs to determine the LRU victim becomes more complicated, right? You need to decode that first to figure it out, right? OK. So most modern processors, when they implement part, uh, and LRU is usually a part of the policy. Modern processors actually have comp relatively complicated policies, but LRU is part of the policy because there are some access patterns that fit nicely with LRU. They do not implement true LRU, it's also called perfect LRU, in highly associative caches. Well, we've already talked about this, right? There are two reasons, actually. One is uh, true LRU is complex, as I've shown you. But also, it's not, it's really an approximation to predict locality anyway. Right? It's, n it's not really something you should follow. <laughs> because you uh, follow, follow uh, so strictly. Because the access patterns do not really match uh, this much of the time also. So it's not the best possible cache management policy. So we'll take a look at two examples, well, several examples. Not most recently used, we've talked about, right? In that case, you basically, uh, need to store two bits, as you've discussed, just the way that's most recently used uh, in this case. Okay, it's really log two 
n bits, right, for n-way associative cache. Hierarchical LRU is another popular policy. I'll go through these relatively quickly, actually. Uh, and the idea over here is to divide the n-way set into m-way groups and track the MRU group and the MRU way in each group. And victim, next victim replacement, these are actually implemented in real processors. Uh, they, this only keeps track of the victim and the next victim. Right. And not MRU may be actually one of the simpler ones, but it doesn't perform as well, unfortunately. <laughs> so a victim, next victim, turns out it performs better. Hierarchical LRU also performs better on average on lots of workloads. OK, so let's take a look at hierarchical LRU very quickly. Uh, and this is not the most recently used policy. Uh, basically, you divide a set into multiple groups. Within a group, uh, well, across groups, you keep, you keep track of only the MRU group, the group that was most recently referenced. And within a group, you keep track of only the MRU block, most recently used block. And on replacement, whenever you need to replace something, you select the victim as a not MRU bl block in one of the not MRU groups. Right. And you can randomly pick one of such blocks or groups. Right. You just don't pick the uh, MRU group, and you just don't pick the MRU block. OK? If you don't pick the MRU group, you're not picking the MRU block anyway. Uh, in that group, yes. That's right, yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but this is kind of a two-level MRU, right, if you think of it. You're not picking the MRU block within other groups also. OK? It's an approximation. OK, I'm going to skip this. You can go through this. But you can think of a 16-way cache with two 8-way groups, right? And then you can think of what is an access pattern that performs worse than true LRU. And you can also think of an access pattern that performs better than true LRU. <laughs> because it's all dependent on the access pattern. If you have two 8-way groups, basically, one group is the MRU group, because it contains the most recently used block in the entire 16 ways. And the other is group is the not MRU group, but you also keep track of the MRU block within that group. So what you replace is really seven out of the, one of the seven blocks in the not MRU group. Make sense? OK. It's fun to think about. It's not that complicated, actually. You can come up with access patterns right away, right now. OK, another policy that's implemented is victim next victim policy. Again, the, the goal ho over here is to get good performance at very low complexity, hopefully, without implementing true LRU. Uh, here, the policy uh, keeps track of only two block status within each set. So your set could be 64 way associative or 16 way associative, but you keep track of only two things the victim, what is to be evicted next, and the next victim, what is to be evicted after that. OK? And all other blocks are denoted as ordinary blocks. And again, here, what you need is really uh, log n bits to uh, designate the victim and log n bits to designate the next victim, where n is your associativity. So it's really two log n. Right? On a cache miss, what happens is you replace the victim. This is, you can think of the victim as the lowest priority block in the set. Right? And make the non-victim to become victim. Maybe promote is not the best word. Distribute demote, right? You're really demoting. It's becoming a lower priority. Actually, I will fix that because I, I like the demote better. <laughs> right. And here I'll fix the promote to demote also. OK. And you randomly pick an ordinary block as non-victim because you're evicting the victim. And non-victim is becoming, a, a, or next victim is becoming uh, the victim, right? So I randomly pick the ordinary block to be the next victim. On a cache hit to victim, now this is the block that you were going to be evict, but you're getting a cache hit on that. We're kind of trying to approximate LRU, which means that it should become the MRU. Next victim becomes victim. And you randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim. And the victim becomes now ordinary. So that hopefully it's not going to be evicted until two until at least two more accesses happen. Right. Make sense? It's kind of a nice policy. On a cache it to the next victim, you randomly pick an ordinary block as next victim. No, next victim becomes ordinary because you just hit on that, and victim still stays as victim, right? 
This is the promotion policy, if you will. Before, uh, I, this is kind of the replacement policy. This is the promotion policy. And these are actually different promotion policies, depending on where the blocks hit. Uh, on a cache hit to ordinary block, basically you do nothing, right? Because ordinary block is the highest priority in this case, except you have multiple highest priority blocks. Make sense? OK, so this is one example. I guess I'll go through this very quickly also. Let's do this. So assume that you have uh, four ways, four blocks in the cache, A, B, C, D. Uh, and these are the victim next victim bits. For each block, we have two bits. This may not be the best way of representing it, actually. Uh, the best way meaning best uh, if the smallest number of bits you need. You can think about the smallest number of bits you need. This is the victim, and this is the next victim. And these are ordinary. When you get a hit to A, what happens is this becomes ordinary. Uh, ordinary. It was the victim, but you're accessing it. So victim next victim, victim bits for this A is set to 0. B is still ordinary. C, which was the next victim, becomes victim now. And D is randomly picked to be the next victim. Okay? You're basically picking from these ordinary blocks. One of them becomes the next victim. Okay. And you can have the same questions as before, actually. When does this do better than LRU? When does this do worse than LRU? And you can come up with examples. Okay. Let's take a look at one other example. LRU versus random. I said random is actually a policy that doesn't require any state. right? You just randomly generate a number between 0 and n, and then you evict that. Which one's better? Depends. I like that answer. <laughs> it depends, yes. Absolutely it depends. <laughs> I'll give you one example. If you have a four-way cache, just like we've been looking at, except you are not able to look at it anymore because it's kind of messed up. <laughs> and you're, you have cyclic references to A, B, C, D, E. All you do is access A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E, A, B, C, D, E. With LRU, you get a 0% hit rate right? with true LRU. With something else, you may do better, actually, with a victim next victim <laughs> because you, do, you add some randomness in it. With a random replacement policy, you get actually a much better hit rate with this. And I'll let you calculate that. Right. Why? Because you randomly pick evict something. And the thing that you randomly evict will not be, hopefully, what the LRU evicts. LRU is very methodical, right? It's really evicting the last, last reference. And the problem here is the last reference is never going to be reused in a four-way associative cache. Right? Instead of evicting the last reference, you have actually a choice of things to evict. Right? You, you, Actually, you're evicting the last reference ones with only 25% probability, right? assuming you have a true random number generator. OK. So you get much better hit rate with the random policy. You can calculate that. So the problem here is this, is, this problem is called set thrashing. The working set of the program that you have in a particular set is larger than the associativity of the set, or of the cache. You're really thrashing the set. And random replacement is better than LRU if this kind of thrashing actually occurs. So in practice, well, it depends. Of course. In practice, everything depends. That's a good answer. But you've got to qualify why it depends. <laughs> in practice, people have found that every average hit rate of LRU across a very large number of workloads uh, is very similar to the average hit rate of random. Because in practice, some workloads exhibit thrashing. Uh, and thrashing, for example, happens when you're scanning across a huge data set, right? Imagine that you're scanning, you have a large data set, and you're scanning an array. And you're trying to find something. And your array is much larger than your cache. It's bringing, you're bringing stuff into the cache that you're never going to reuse because your cache is, is not large enough. Right? In those cases, random is better. In other cases, LRU is better. So maybe you can get the best of both worlds by combining LRU and random. Then the key question is, how do you actually combine it? We may get to this. But one idea that uh, people have developed is the idea of set sampling. Basically, one thing you could do is you could implement both policies and pick the one that's doing better. Right. Complexity, unfortunately, that's a problem. But if you want to get better hit rate, you can actually 
implement both policies and emulate what they would do. Now you think about what, what, what may be needed for this. You may need some additional tag stores, right, to actually emulate what the policies would do. Because your main tag store is really the policy you're following. But you have some auxiliary tag stores. One implements random policy. The other implements LRU. And you keep track of how many hits you're getting if you use the LRU policy versus if you use the random policy. And pick the one that's doing better. OK? The upside of this is you get better performance if you combine LRU and random. The downside is much higher complexity. How do you reduce the complexity? Well, maybe you can sample among the sets. You don't implement the full tag store, but you implement select some sets to follow the LRU policy and the same sets or some other sets to follow the random policy. And then you compare which one do, which one's doing better. And if you've sampled enough sets, maybe you kind of sample the average behavior of the program, right? OK? Does that make sense? Yes, OK. You can, this is your reading that you're going to do, so hopefully you'll learn more about it. Let's talk about the optimal replacement policy. Have you heard about Velody's opt? No? Well, there's something you didn't learn in 213. 213 doesn't cover Beldi's optimal policy? OK. So uh, Beldi developed the optimal policy. Basically, this is the optimal policy if you want to maximize the hit rate. And the idea is actually very simple, right? Replace a block that's going to be referenced furthest into the future, <laughs> which makes sense, because that's the block that you're, not going, you're going to need the latest. And this is the paper that discusses Actually, this discusses it in, t in the context of virtual memory systems. How do you manage the physical memory? What do you evict uh, when you run out of your physical memory? Right? Physical memory is the same as a cache. Right? You have hardware cache. An L1 cache is a cache to the DRAM, whereas DRAM is a cache to the disk. Right? OK. So how do you implement this? I don't know. But you need to somehow figure out what's the block that you're going to reference in the future. If you knew that, that would be great, right? Well, you don't know it. Even simulating this is hard, actually. So one question, this, is this optimal for minimizing this rate? Yes or no? I guess who says yes? <laughs> Not a trick question. <laughs> Does this minimize your miss rate? Come on, be brave. Yes? Yes, I think so. I think so. It's close enough to yes. I'll take it. Who else says yes? One more. All right, let's go with that. <laughs> One more yes. No. Not always. Why? Uh-huh. Right. So like when you're in the first chunk, you'll see that like, oh, these guys are kind of far off. Uh -huh. So I'll see like more repeats in my chunk. So I'll like evict everyone who's gonna be in this chunk and then just keep the guys in my chunk. I see. And then when you get to the next one, you like see that again. Uh -huh. And then now you're like, oh I wish I could have kept the previous one. But this one captures it, right? What you described, this one is I think this one captures it because it's re gonna really replace the block that's gonna be referenced furthest into the future. So the, the, basically, with your chunks, some of, one of them is going to be furthest into the future, and that's going to be replaced. <laughs> OK, <laughs> yeah. So the answer is yes, actually. <laughs> you guys were <laughs> right, <laughs> even though you were <laughs> In the exam, don't write, I think so. <laughs> the answer is yes, uh, with some assumptions. The assumption is that whatever block is coming in should be put into the cache. That's the assumption, right? Basically, the assumption is that you've got to do replacement. Because we didn't even uh, say that uh, there, there's the option of bypassing the cache also, right? Do you actually keep this block that's incoming in the cache or not? We, we didn't even give you that choice. 
So even if that assumption is true, this is actually the best policy. If you come up with a proof against it, you can tell me. <laughs> the other question, hopefully it's easier, is, is this optimal for minimizing execution time? Who says yes? That's OK. You can be wrong. <laughs> no? I hear. I see not. Uh, I see these. Who says no? OK, there are lots of no's. That's good. <laughs> so I guess no is easier to say than yes in this case. <laughs> so yeah, the answer is no here. Basically, what this does not take into account is what we've discussed earlier, right? The cost or latency of MS. Right? This takes into account uh, if, the, if the cache misses are all equal cost, absolutely equal cost. A cache miss causes the same amount of stall, regardless of what block it is to and what kind of system condition you're in. Then Beldi's optimus truly minimize the execution time. But that's not real life, unfortunately. Cache miss latency and cost varies from block to block. There are two reasons. Well, there are multiple reasons, but uh, two reasons are remote versus local caches, as we've discussed, or your cache, uh, your, uh, your Miss at this level can hit at some other level, and that other level may be different for different blocks. And you can actually have overlapping of misses. Right? And I've discussed that also. Some cache misses may be overlapped with many, many other cache misses. So lots of cache misses are really stalling the processor only for once. Whereas one other cache miss may be a lot more important. When, it's, when, it, when that happens, it actually stalls the processor. You can think of groups of cache misses. Whenever you're accessing block A, you access block A, and that stalls the process. And that's the only thing you're doing. You're just waiting for block A. Whereas another set of cache misses, imagine blocks uh, x through t, or x through z. You're accessing those blocks in parallel, and you're waiting for their, uh, them to come back at the same time. And when they all come back, you can continue. Now, which one is more important? Block A is more important, right? Because if you keep it in the cache and if you keep it cached, you don't stall for that. Whereas for the other ones, x, x, y, z, you basically need to keep all of them in the cache if you don't want to stall. And we'll see that. Uh, and this is your reading that we will uh, see about. I'll go through this aside and then we'll, uh, we'll take a break, quick break. Actually, I kind of talked about this. We'll see this more. But uh, you've seen virtual memory, and you've seen page replacement in uh, DRAM, right, in 2.13. Basically, physical memory is a cache for disk in a virtual memory system. It's usually managed by system software. We have the virtual memory subsystem. Page replacement is really similar to ca cache replacement. And page table, which we will go into more detail about, is the tag store for the physical memory data store. Right? That's what's really happening, except page tables implement then software. And there are differences, obviously. Uh, required speed of access to the cache is usually much faster, right? You really want the, for, for example, at the L1 cache, you want the access to be one cycle, ideally, as we've discussed. Whereas physical memory, when it's as a cache for a disk, it can take a long time, which means that the policies that you implement can be more complicated here, right? Number of blocks in a cache is usually much smaller than the number of blocks in the physical memory. And if you want to find a replacement candidate, in this case, we're trying to find a replacement candidate uh, with, with, within four ways, let's say. No, it's not there, but four ways. Uh, it, it, you want to do that relatively quickly, right? Whereas if you're replacing a page in the DRAM, you need to access the new page that you're bringing in from disk or SSD anyway. So you have a lot of latency to make that uh, replacement decision. And that replacement decision is actually made in the operating system today, right? Well, role of the hardware versus software. Since that boundary between DRAM and disk is really managed by the system software, the software manages that, makes that replacement policy decision, right? It can be assisted by the hardware, as we will see, uh, because we'll have TLBs to accelerate uh, the, uh, the, the, the virtual memory access time as well as uh, TLBs will also keep track of which pages are actually most recently used, right? Re recently accessed. 
But here, you, all of the decisions are in hardware. OK. Maybe we should take a break for three minutes, and then we'll come back and breeze through some other cache design decisions. <laughs> OK, what's in a tag store entry? Uh, we figured out that valid bit is there, tag is there, and you need some bits for replacement policy, right? And you need a valid bit and a tag for each block in the set. But replacement policy bits can be aggregate, right? It doesn't need to be per block, as we've just discussed, right? It can be actually across the entire set. It could encode an ordering of all blocks. What about a dirty bit? Have you guys heard of the dirty bit? You implement that in 2.13? No? Yes? Maybe. You didn't deal with writes in 2.13? You don't remember? Oh, you didn't. OK. Good. So we'll talk about writes, because writes actually complicate the cache. And the, one of the design decisions, do you have a write-back cache or write-through cache? If you have a write-back cache, what this means is you can modify the data inside the cache and not modify it in the next level, which means that you need to keep track of the, whether or not the data is dirty or the block is dirty in the cache. Then you need a dirty bit. If you have write through, that means that you modify whenever you do a store or write into the cache, you modify the data, but you also modify the data in the next level. That way, in that case, you don't need a dirty bit because everything, all levels are consistent. The data is modified in all levels. And why do I? All right. <laughs> I see something else up there. I'm glad that that's not what you're seeing. And I frankly don't know how to fix it. All right, and maybe it's not important. <laughs> OK, so handling writes. Uh, basically, the key question is when do we write the modified data in a cache to the next level? Write through means at the time the write happens. Basically, the cache and the next level are written at the same time. Write back means when the block is evicted. So write back uh, requires a dirty bit per block. Why, why do you want to do that? Well. Maybe you can consolidate multiple writes to the same cache block before eviction, right? What you're, if you're, what you're doing is you don't do just one write and evict the block. If you can do five writes, you can really consolidate those writes in the block before you write back the block into the next level. This potentially saves bandwidth between the ca cache levels and hopefully saves energy as well, right? Makes sense. The downside is you need a bit in the tag store indicating the block is dirty or modified. Right through, on the other hand, is simpler. You don't need a dirty bit. And when you evict the cache block, you don't need to write it back because you've already done the write. And the, the other advantage of write through is all levels are now up to date. Right? So we'll see later the problem of cache coherence or consistency. You get simpler cache coherence here because you don't need to check the lower level caches. So what this means is, uh, let's say, it's kind of a flash forward to the future, but document camera, you can see it. So you have this L1 cache, and let's assume that you have this L2 cache, and you're, you have block A here, and then block A also here, because you, when you, whenever you filled in, you can put it into both caches. That's a design decision also. Let's assume that it's here. And you wrote to this. Now you have really uh, dirty bits set to if you look at the tag store, you have a valid bit, dirty bit, tag. Dirty bit is set, and valid bit is set. Here, you have the block A, but it's not the same block A because the value, you updated this cache, but you didn't update because this is a write back cache, right? Now let's sit, take a look. You have another processor, let's say processor 0 here, accessing this L1, and processor 1, let's connect to this other L1. Now it needs to, uh, let's say it needs to access block A because you're, it's doing a load from there. If it goes and gets it from L2, which could be shared between different cores, it'll get the wrong value, right? Because this processor updated block A over here. That's the cache coherence problem. You have an inconsistent copy in some cache. So you need to really supply the correct value. 
Whereas if this processor actually did write through, this would be up to date. This would be the same. These would both be the same. When this processor accessed L2 to get block A, it would get the correct value. Yes? So let's say block A was already in both L1 caches yep. and you're doing write through. Uh -huh. Then if one processor writes, then, yes. then the other L1 cache is now in programming. That's right, yes. So the, the same problem exists. So in that case, write through means really write everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yes, you're, you're kind of envisioning the other problems that happen with coherence. OK? But this makes it simpler. It doesn't completely eliminate the problem. But this makes it simpler because you don't need to check for coherence at, uh, at all levels. OK. The downside of write through, and this is why it's not implemented in many processors, it's more bandwidth intensive. Because there is no, it doesn't do this. This is called coalescing of writes. It's really you're consolidating multiple writes or coalescing them in the same cache block. And if you don't do that, you could actually, you're exposing lots of writes to the lower levels of the hierarchy. As a result, uh, you're more bandwidth intensive. OK, we'll get back to uh, the consistency or coherence issue, and we'll cover that. And that's, that's your lab eight, actually. You implement a coherence protocol. You'll be proud of it at the end. <laughs> Handling writes. So there are other questions on writes, actually. One question is do we allocate a cache block on a write miss? Let's say you're, you're writing to the cache, you're doing a store. And it's a cache miss. Do you allocate the block? Do you bring it uh, from memory and actually allocate it? This question exists in reads also, right? Whenever you're doing a read uh, or load, it's not in the cache. Do you bring the block into the cache? Well, if you don't have good locality, maybe you don't bring it into the cache, right? But writes are actually interesting because write, people have observed different behavior between writes and reads uh, when they were designing caches first. And they, as a result, they do two possible policies. If you allocate the block on a write miss, then the answer is yes to this question. Or the policy that answers this question no is called the no allocate policy, write no allocate. Let's take a look at the advantage and disadvantage of each. Allocate on a write miss. The upside is, again, you can consolidate writes instead of writing each of them individually to the next level, right? If you actually bring the entire block into the cache. It's simpler because write misses can be treated exactly the same as read misses. Whenever you get a write miss, it's the same path that read misses take. Right? You bring the entire block into the cache. The downside is it requires the transfer of the whole cache block. And I have a question mark here because we're going to try to fix that problem in a little bit. No allocate policy, on the other end, it conserves cache space if the locality of writes is low. You can potentially get a better cache hit rate. And some people observe that locality of writes is actually lower than locality of reads. But that doesn't, again, that really depends on your access pattern, right? OK? So it's a simple decision also. OK, one other question. What if the processor writes to an entire block over a small amount of time? In this case, does it make sense to bring the entire block to the cache? So let's say, well, I guess we still have it here. Maybe I'll reuse what resources we have. Doesn't make sense to waste. You have, let's say, well, maybe I do have an example over here. Oh, no. <laughs> OK, a 64-byte block. And let's assume uh, you, you're, uh, basically you have an 8-byte write store for 8 bytes. And what you're doing is you're storing this 8 bytes. You're doing a streaming store or streaming write. Basically, what you're doing is you're storing these 8 bytes in the block, and then these 8 bytes, 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 dot, dot, dot. You're really streaming through that block, and you're doing a store. And you could do it for 4 bytes also. You can do a store word. In this case, I guess I'm assuming you store double word. There's no need to bring this block into the cache in that case, right? Because you're going to overwrite it anyway, if you have a write back cache. Basically, uh, you can actually uh, do, do uh, this is true for a portion of the block also. If you're actually writing just to this part, do you actually need to bring the remaining part? Maybe not, right? Because maybe later you'll write to this part, and then write to this part, and then write to this part, and eventually you'll actually construct the entire cache line 
without ever needing to read it. So it may not make sense to go all the way to memory to bring the cache block first. And this is one example, basically. And people have developed the idea of sectored caches for this purpose, basically. The idea is to divide a block into subblocks, or also called sectors. And these sectors or subblocks share a tag. So they're actually part of the same block. But they have individual valid and dirty bits. It's now interesting, right? They don't share the valid and dirty bits, but they share just the tag. So your tag overhead is not high, but now you're increasing the valid and dirty bits. Now what do these individual dirty bits buy you? Well, if you're writing the subblock, you just basically make it valid, make it dirty, change the tag. Now you have it in the cache. You don't need to bring anything else, really. And then if you're writing the next subblock, you make it valid, you make it dirty. That's it. If you're writing the next subblock, you make it valid, make it dirty, dot, dot, dot. Right. That way you don't need to actually bring the block first into the cache to write to it. And this is very useful when you actually have streaming writes. Okay? That's the reason why sector caches are there. And if you attended the talk on Wednesday, this was one of the things that the speaker was complaining about. Basically, I guess he was complaining that Intel and AMD processors don't have sector caches. But people actually have implemented sector caches. A lot of IBM processors have sector caches, for example. Uh, if you read the uh, Z processor series, cache uh, documentation, you'll see that they have sector caches. OK, the big upside is there is no need to transfer the entire cache block into the cache. And this was what the speaker wanted also on Wednesday, right? <laughs> he said, I'm writing this block, in, writing this entire block. Why is this processor bringing the block into the cache first? So basically, a write simply validates and updates a subblock. There's another upside to this. There's now more freedom in transferring subblocks into the cache, right? A cache block does not need to be in the cache fully now. Before, let's assume that this is 64 bytes. All 64 bytes need to be in the cache. Right now, you can have a few of the subblocks, right? Or maybe one subblock in the cache. So it gives you more freedom even on a read. Maybe you don't transfer all of the subblocks on a read, right? Maybe you can do finer grain prediction. You first transfer the subblock you need, and then over time, maybe you transfer some of them, if you can predict which ones you're going to use. The downside is no more complex design, right? Well, complexity comes from now, if, if you have 8-byte subblocks in a 64-byte block, you have, you've increased uh, your valid and dirty bit size by 8x. But you have not increased your tag size. That's the upside here. That's the difference between smaller blocks and a sector cache. The alternative could be make your blocks smaller, right? If you make your blocks smaller, your tag size becomes larger, right? But here, really, we're having a single block. But well, I guess you can think about uh, one good question could be, what is the upside of smaller blocks versus a subblock cache, right? If you have smaller blocks, let's say eight byte blocks, now your tag size is larger. So your tag store is larger. But now you have potentially more things that can be stored in the cache. Whereas if you have subblocks, your tag size is smaller, but it's less flexible. Because you cannot store any arbitrary things in the, uh, in the subblocks. They really need to share the tag. OK. And this may not exploit spatial lookouts fully when used for reads. Right? So if you actually bring in one subblock on a read, you may not be exploiting full spatial locality across the entire block. But it en enables you, it gives you the flexibility to do so. Okay. Another design decision, instruction versus data caches. Do you want them separate or unified? Did you cover this in 2.13? You didn't have an instruction versus data cache? You did? I see. OK, they exist. <laughs> So unified, why do they exist? Uh, you can make them unified, right? You don't, you don't need to separate a, an instruction cache. Uh, basically, an instruction cache is the cache that stores instructions. Program counter fetches into the instruction cache, right? Whereas loads and stores fetch into the data cache. 
but you don't need to have separate caches. If you have uh, unified caches, now you can actually share the space. Let's assume that you have uh, a budget of 64 kilobytes to spend on the cache. If you have a single cache that's used for, this is the fetch stage, this is the memory access stage. Fetch stage accesses this with the program counter. Memory access stage accesses this with the uh, whatever address. This 64 kilobytes of space can be shared between instructions and data. You're really dynamically sharing it. So if the instruction working set is uh, 60 kilobytes and the data working set is 4 kilobytes, the amount of data that you need, well, you can fit it, hopefully. All right. Or vice versa, right? this is 40, maybe 8 kilobytes versus 56 kilobytes, right? It fits nicely. Well, same. Uh, that's the big advantage, dynamic sharing of space. The downside is instructions and data can trash each other, right? If you have it, uh, oh, let's, let's go back to the other, uh, other option. The other option is divide the same space. You have 32 kilobyte instruction cache and a 32 kilobyte data cache. The downside of this is, what if your data cache working set was 56 kilobytes, and your instruction cache working set was 8 kilobytes? Now you partition the caches. You cannot store more than 32 kilobytes in the data cache, so you get a lot of cache misses here. But you have a lot of space here you're not using. Right? That's the downside of static partitioning at any given time. Right? This is very similar to. Uh, shared versus distributed reservation stations that we've discussed, right? It's the same trade-off that you're making, basically. That's the downside of statically partitioned instruction and data caches versus a single cache that's dynamically partitioned between instructions and data. But dynamic partitioning always has this place uh, uh, problem, which is things that are part, uh, being partitioned, instructions and data in this case, can trash each other. Because they, they basically share the same space. They interfere with each other, right? There's no guaranteed space. Whereas here, you're guaranteeing space. And this, this may be a problem. For example, if your instructions, your data cache working set size is, data working set size is 1 megabyte, and your instructions are 32 kilobytes. Well, you have a problem here, right? That huge data set working side may trash the instructions, and you may be stalling a lot if you have, a sh if you have shared space. There's another problem, which is instruction and data cache are accessed in different places in the pipeline. Right? If you look at this, this picture was very accurate, actually. You have this fetch. And for instruction access, you're accessing in the fetch stage. And for data access, you're accessing uh, memory in the uh, data cache stage, or memory access stage. And these are actually pretty far from each other. If you need to place a unified cache, where do you place it? Do you place it in the middle? Do you make it multi-ported? Or do you place it closer to the fetch? How do you do the wiring? Right. That's actually a very real problem. And that's one of the major reasons, actually the major reason, why instruction and data caches are partitioned. You put the instruction supply very close to the fetch unit. You put the data supply very close to the memory access unit. So first level caches are split between instructions and data mainly because of this reason. Although these reasons matter too. The, the, the second one uh, over here matters too. But second and higher levels are almost always unified. You don't usually see processors with L2 instruction cache, L2 data cache, and L3 instruction cache, L3 data cache. They're usually unified, right? Hasn't, been, hasn't always been the case. OK, let's talk a look at multi-level caching a little bit. And we've discussed this a little bit. First level caches, as I said before, decisions are very much affected by the cycle time and the design of the pipeline. As a result, you have small caches, lower associativity caches, right? because you need, your cycle time needs to be fast. And for the same reason, because you want to supply data quickly to the pipeline, tag store and data store are accessed in parallel. Remember indexing? You index into the tag store and the data store at the same time. You get the uh, data outputs from both, and then you, uh, you, you mux the data uh, from the data store from different ways. Second level cache, on the other hand, decisions really need to balance the hit rate and the access latency here. So you're, you're, not, really as much, you're not really affected by the cycle time as much. Right? But these are usually large and highly associative, and latency are not, is not as important, although modern processors are having more and more levels. 
So latency of the second level is becoming also important. And maybe third level is becoming less important. And tag store and data store are accessed serially in most second level or third level caches. And the reason is you want to save power, right? Especially think about a large cache, a 40, 48 megabyte cache. Do you really want to be powering up all of the 64 ways at every access? Maybe it's better to first figure out uh, all of the 64 data ways at every access. Maybe it's better to power up the 64 tag ways and then determine if you have a tag match. If you don't have a tag match, you don't even need to power up the data ways. If you do have a tag match, now you can actually have the index. right? You just power up that particular way that you need an index into it. Does that make sense? That way you don't actually access all of the ways in the data store. That's right, serial access uh, is beneficial, but only if the latency is less important. Basically, it's an indirection, right? You're accessing the tag store first to get the index into the data store, and then you're accessing the data store next. And that indirection adds latency because now you have serial access. OK, basically, serial access, there's also serial and parallel access of levels, right? You have the, let's do this. You have the first level cache, L1 cache. L2 cache. We've discussed the uh, idea of, and this, this consists of a tag store versus data store. You normally access tag store and data store in parallel at the same time, whereas here in the L2 cache, you first access the tag store, and tag store gives you whether it's a miss. If it's a miss, you don't access the data store. If it's a hit in the tag store, then basically you know exactly which data way you need to power up, and then you go and figure out power up only that way. You access only that way. That way you don't waste dynamic power here. But there's also the question, when you access one level, do you also access in parallel the next level? Right. Well, if most of the time you're going to miss in this level, maybe you start that access early to the next level. Right. That's the upside of doing a parallel access. Serial access means second level cache or next level cache is accessed only if the previous level misses. Uh, and that's usually the case in most caches today, actually. You normally don't start accesses to all levels at the same time. Right. But there may be cases where you may want to start access to the next level, if, especially if it's latency critical. So this means that because we do a lot of serial access of levels, second level does not see the same accesses as the first one. Right. And we've seen this before. First level kind of acts as a filter. right? It sees all of the requests coming from the processor which means that it filters some temporal and spatial locality. The next level is kind of different. The first level is seeing, let's say your access stream is A, uh, a plus 1, A plus 2, A plus 3, A plus 4. You're streaming, and then you're jumping somewhere. The first level will see uh, all of the accesses. The second level will see the accesses that don't hit. So you may not see as good spatial locality in the next level, right? and as good temporal locality also. As a result, management policies are different. We can actually implement more complicated management policies at the next level. OK. Any questions so far? OK. Let's look at cache performance a little bit. Uh, how cache parameters affect uh, hit, uh, miss versus hit rate. Well, I guess miss and hit rate is one minus each other. But also, we'll look at latency too. Let's start with cache size. So, cache size, when uh, people talk about cache size, uh, we normally indicate the total data capacity. Normally, tag capacity is not included, even though it could be a substantial portion. For when people say, for example, 64 kilobyte cache, it really refers to the data store. And if you have 64 byte blocks, you really have 1K blocks in that cache. Tag store is not included. Uh, if you look at the cache size versus hit rate, this is a very common graph. Basically, your hit rate increases as you increase the cache size, and at some point it saturates. But this is not the only graph. You can have many, many graphs. You can have zero hit rate for a long time. If your cache is thrashing, for example, right? you could actually have the same behavior that we showed in the sets if you, have, if you don't have enough blocks in your cache. So bigger caches can exploit temporal locality better, but not always better because of what I said. Right? You may not have enough blocks in the cache to keep your working set. And working set, well, we'll get to it. Actually, let me do this. Working set is the whole set of data the ex executing application references within a time interval. Right. And ideally, you would like to keep your, your, uh, your cache size should be the same size as your working set, such that your cache 
uh, keeps all of the data that you need. Right? But that may not always be the case. So if you have too large of a cache, uh, you increase the hit and miss latency, certainly, right? Because you need to access, uh, if you, if you, it's smaller is faster, as we've discussed. So access time may degrade the critical path. If the cache is too small, it doesn't exploit temporal locality well. As a result, useful data is replaced often. So this is easy. What about block size? So block size is the data that's associated with an address tag, as we've discussed, right? It's really the unit of storage in the cache. It's not necessarily the unit of transfer between hierarchies. I'd like to distinguish between this. Uh, for example, if you have sub-blocks, you're really dividing the block into multiple pieces, each with its own valid bit. So you can transfer. Your block size could be 64 bytes, but you can transfer 8 bytes at a time. So your bus between the cache levels can be, doesn't need to be 64 bytes. In fact, it's not, right? If you look at the memory bus, it's really not that wide. So this is your L1. This is your L2. Your block size here can be 64 bytes. And your block size can be here 64 bytes. But whenever you're accessing, this bus doesn't need to be 64 bytes, right? It can be 32 bytes, for example. And it takes two cycles, or two bus cycles, to transfer an entire cache time from here to here. And if you're actually uh, accessing the DRAM bus, let's say the 64 bits or 8 bytes, well, you need to do eight accesses, eight bus transfers, to actually fill a cache line in the L2 cache. Right. So block size doesn't need to be. It's decoupled from the size of your bus over here. OK, we also talked about sub-blocking. So if you have two small blocks, assuming you have the same cache size, two small blocks means you have lots of blocks in the cache also, right? You may not exploit sp spatial locality well. That's kind of the blocking, uh, the, the idea of a block, right? If you increase the size, you exploit spatial locality better. And also, small blocks lead to larger tag overhead, as we've seen, right, for a given cache size. If you have two large blocks, well, now you have fewer number of total blocks, right, assuming the same cache size. As a result, you, get, you can exploit temporal locality less, perhaps. Again, this depends on your access pattern. But the upside is. Uh, your tax store overhead is low. And you also cache, uh, waste cache space and bandwidth if spatial locality is not high, right? Two large blocks, if you, if you design a cache that has large blocks, you're really hoping that your spatial locality is high. If that's not true, there's no reason to design a cache with large blocks. Does that make sense? OK. OK. So large blocks, people wanted large blocks for spatial applications with spatial locality. But there are two issues with it. One is uh, cache blocks can take a long time to fill into the cache. To fix this problem, one thing you could do is you could first bring the critical word into the cache. Do you guys know what I mean by critical word? That's the word that's requested by the processor, for example. You do a load, load uh, uh, needs to access, let's say it's really accessing this block A over here. But the black A consists of really 64 bytes. But this load needs bytes 31, let's say, or 32. Doesn't matter. If you bring this entire cache block in order from DRAM, remember we said it takes eight cycles, eight bus cycles, to transfer the entire cache block. And let's make it more dramatic. Let's say you're really accessing byte 63 here, last byte, you really get the byte that you need at the very end, eight bus cycles later. Right? Whereas if you know the critical word, well, you know the critical word when you do the load, critical byte over here, or critical portion of the block is the last byte, you basically supply that information to the lower level, and the lower level first returns that critical byte. If it has the ability to return that quickly, then you can fill the cache first with the critical word and supply to the processor also at the same time. And the processor can continue while you're filling the cache. Does that make sense? That's the idea of critical word first. It's actually employed in many systems today because the DRAM access latencies are very long. You don't want to be 
especially uh, imagine that this becomes a bigger problem if your block size increases, right? With 256 byte blocks, this is a bigger problem compared to 64 byte blocks. OK, large cache blocks can also waste bus bandwidth. And actually, subblocking helps here, especially when you're doing streaming writes. And you kind of discussed this uh, earlier. OK, associativity. What about the associativity? I, I, I've shown you this picture before, so I'll go through this very quickly. If you have larger associativity, you get lower miss rate overall. And you have less variation among programs also, because some programs have uh, like better, uh, higher associativity. Some programs don't care. If you, have, if you design a higher associative cache, then you actually cover more programs uh, to get good hit rate. The downside is you get this kind of curve, diminishing returns. And also, you get higher hit latency right, with higher associativity. Smaller associativity has lower cost and lower hit latency. This is especially important for L1 caches. Right? OK. One question I like asking is, do you, do you need an associativity that's a power of 2? It's better. Why is it better? The, Kevin over there is saying, no, you don't need it. <laughs> associative doesn't matter. It doesn't, doesn't uh, affect uh, the breakup. Associative just tells you how many, uh, just affects how many index bits you need. Is that true? <laughs> Let's take a look quickly. This is fun, I guess. <laughs> Wait, no, you're saying <laughs> you change your mind. All right, that's good. It's good to think and change your mind. But basically, think about what, an, what associativity is, right? You're really indexing with some bits. Uh, and the number of index bits de determine how many sets you have, right? And Associativity tells, using the same index bits, you can go here, you can go here, right? Basically, the, your set consists of n blocks. And what you do later is get the blocks across these different ways and try to match your tag, right? There's nothing here that says the number of ways should be 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. It could be 19, right? Right? Because all you care about is if you don't want to waste index bits, the number of bits that are here is a power, uh, well, this is really a power of 2 because you take some number of bits, right? If you have n index bits, you have 2 to the n sets. And you basically match the tag later. It's really associative access. There's nothing that you use from the address to actually determine the weight, right? Well, it is. You're kind of using the tag for it, but it's, there, there's no relationship between the number of bits that you use in the tag and the number of ways you need to have, because you're really doing a full comparison of the tag. OK? So you can actually easily have a three-way cache or a 38-way cache. So it's not required. Well, the only things that you may waste over here is you may waste some wires over here, right? Because you need to do the selection logic in the mux at the end. OK. Let me classify the cache misses, uh, and then we'll probably finish. Unfortunately, we, I didn't cover everything I wanted to cover in caches. But. So this is the 3C classification of cache misses, if you will. We'll add coherence misses later on over here. But compulsory miss is the first reference to an address or a block. And this always results in a miss, right, if, if it's, uh, it's not in your cache. That's also called a cold miss. Subsequent references should hit unless the cache block is displaced for the reasons that are below. You don't have enough capacity or somebody conflicted with it. Right? So a capacity miss, cache is too small to hold everything needed, basically. It's really more formally defined as the misses that would occur even in a fully associative cache with optimal replacement of the same capacity. 
That's, real, that's a real capacity miss. It's not because you couldn't have enough associativity, right? And you didn't manage the cache well. Conflict miss, on the other hand, is defined as any miss that's neither a compulsory miss nor a capacity miss, right? It's not because it's the first time you're seeing this block, and it's not because you don't have enough capacity. Somebody conflicted with it. Right? So how do you reduce each mistype? And we're going to cover a lot of this in the next lectures. Compulsory misses, can you reduce them with caching? Remember, this is the first time you see a block ever. It just appears. You've never seen it before. It can load blocks randomly. And that's called prefetching. <laughs> yeah, basically caching doesn't help the compulsory misses, right? You need somehow do something else, which is prefetching, which we will cover in a later lecture. Conflict misses, we've seen already, right? More associativity, right? Or maybe other ways to get more associativity without making the cache as associative. And we'll cover this. People have looked at this a lot. And one idea could be maybe you select your index bits in a smarter way, right? Maybe you try to randomize the index a little bit. Or maybe you add a separate cache, victim cache, hashing. Or maybe you manage it better in software. So we'll cover this in, in the next lectures. Capacity miss, on the other end, well, I guess have a bigger cache is one, <laughs> one solution to this, obviously. But barring that, you may want to utilize your cache space better if you want to reduce your capacity misses, right? Keep blocks that will be referenced or have more software management. What you can do is what we will discuss with what's called blocking. You can actually design your software such that it fits a part of your work working set in the cache and operates on that, and then moves to another working set and moves to another working set. So it blocks the data. Instead of operating on the huge metric matrix, it operates on a chunk of the matrix first, and then the next chunk of the matrix, and the next chunk of the matrix, and then dot, dot, dot. So this is uh, what we will cover in a little bit. But remember, before we move on, uh, this is the average memory access time, right? You can actually improve the sandwich memory access time. And maybe you can think of this as not missed latency anymore, but really missed cost. You can reduce the miss rate. And when you reduce the miss rate, this can reduce performance, right? We, we went back to this, right? Because you can actually, it can actually lead to uh, the eviction of very costly to refetch blocks. So I promise that we will co come back to this. I'll end this with this slide and with this slide. But if you reduce the miss rate, you can actually increase the miss latency, for example. You can reduce miss latency and cost. That's another way of uh, improving performance. And you can reduce hit latency and cost. That's another way of improving performance. So there are many ways you can improve performance. And we're going to look at some of these later on. But keep these in mind. So in the next lecture, we're going to go into how to improve basic cache performance. Basically, we're going to look at more uh, alternatives or enhancements to associativity and better replacement insertion policies and software approaches. We're also going to reducing missed latency and cost. And we've already seen some of these, but well, multi-level cache is one way of actually reducing missed latency, right? Uh, but we're, all, we're going to look at non-blocking caches, so supporting multiple access per cycle and software approaches. So this is a good place to stop. Uh, and we'll, we'll start with this in the next lecture. Have a good weekend and start your labs. <laughs> <laughs>